My first pedal board was four pieces of wood, some carpet, and a few screws that my dad helped me put together. Dan Electro covered half of that board, and many more of their pedals would find their way into my guitar rigs over the next 20 years. This brand has been a big part of my guitar journey, just like it has for many of you. But who is Dan Electro? My name is Steve Reidinger, the company's Vets Corporation, and we do the Snark Tuner, and we do the Dan Electro electronics and the guitars. At age 14, Steve created his first fuzz box and sold 3,000 units. At age 19, he created the Mighty Fox Tone Machine and brought the Fox line of pedals to the market. He went on to export guitars internationally. He introduced one of the world's first electronic guitar tuners. He brought Arion pedals to the world, launched a line of amplifiers. He even helped make the fax machine famous in the United States. But in 1997, he resurrected a long lost brand. Tell us about the origins of Dan Electro. I have, I have some of the old stuff made in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I have an old amp or two reverb mm -hmm. tank. Nat Daniels was brilliant. He was a genius. I, I'm not a musician necessarily, but he really had an ear and knew what he was doing. He started out making amps. He was making amps for Epiphone under their brand when he first started. But he was an amp guy, really knew circuits. And he invented an early tremolo circuit that is still very good. He got a contract with Sears where he was making all the amps for Sears and then Sears wanted electric guitars. So he began to manufacture electric guitars long about 56 or somewhere around there, maybe a little earlier. And he made every electric guitar and amp that Sears sold for a long stretch of time there. As fast as you could make an electric guitar, you could sell it. And so he was manufacturing huge numbers. He apparently got tired of the business. And so 68, Nat Daniels sells Dan Electro to MCA Universal for six million. And why they bought it, I have no idea. But Sears was the main customer. In the following year, Sears said, we're not buying anything from you anymore. We're gonna buy it from other people. And MCA says, we're gonna lose money now. So they just closed the factory down a year after buying it, right? Six so, million dollars. Yeah, and just and that, that was a lot of money in those days. So, so there was all these parts, necks and bodies floating around. And so I won't mention his name, but the guy that we bought the trademark from began to get some of those necks and bodies put together. So he began to do this on a small scale. And then when I read The Recycler in 94, 95, which was a newspaper in LA where people would trade gear, kind of like eBay or Reverb now, but in those days it's a print newspaper. And I'm, you know, I'm looking at Standell, Magnetone, I'm looking at all these vintage brands, right? And I go, Dan Electro, that's the one. And that's the one we ended up buying and, and bringing back. And we got a hold of this guy because he had, as early as 1980, began to use the trademark again. And so we bought the trademark from him in 95, early 95. Once again, planning to make just the pedals, which we launched in Jan 97 at, uh, at NAM. But every dealer said, where's the guitars? So then we didn't plan on it, but we ended up making the guitars. So a year later, we launched the guitars. It was crazy. We sold 10,000 the NAM show, 100,000 guitars that year, as fast as we could add factories. It was nuts. That's crazy. But it had been off the market 40 years, and the market was in a big retro phase right then. It was just, there was fist fights in some of the stores. And this is the last guitar, who gets to buy? It was just, it was crazy. It was really crazy. It's interesting because I only had heard the Dan Electro name once as a kid, and so many of the stores said Dan Electro, and it just, it was like, bing, something went off in my brain. I was like, I don't know why. But then years later, we ended up buying the brand. So, yeah. so I'm 16, 17 years old. Yeah. I walk into my local Muscle Shoals, Alabama music store. And there store, it is. Counts the Brothers Dan Echo Pedal. This is here. I try it. And my girlfriend buys me this. Is she your wife now? Or was this? No. Okay. No. We broke up and got she it. ripped up Pearl Jam tickets in my face. So it's, really? It's on an earlier but you got episode. the Dan Echo. I think this is responsible for me being fascinated with pedals and ending really? up having a pedal company. Wow. But this kind of comes out of nowhere here. You bring Dan Electro back right. and you release these pedals. The first three were the Fab Tone Distortion and the Daddio Overdrive and then the Chorus. Then we had this design for what we thought was a pretty good echo pedal, but we weren't sure. So we wanted to get some validation. And we called up this guy named Matt Brock, who was a writer for Guitar World magazine. And we said, we'd like you to hear it. And he said, sure. And he gave us an address up in the hills above LA. And we're winding around these roads in the mountains there. And we finally come to this huge mansion. I'm thinking, 
Guitar World writer. You know, this is pretty good. Anyway, so he buzzes us in. He says, drive to the back, to the guest house and back. So we go in there and we're playing the pedal for him. He's playing the pedal. And in walks Van Halen in his pajamas wearing a Joker hat. And Van Halen is digging it. And uh, I've never seen fingers so big in my, I mean, I don't have this guy plays guitar at all. But anyway, uh, he's playing the, at this point, it's just a circuit board with some jacks mounted on it. And he goes, I gotta have this. And we go, sure, we're gonna get you some as soon as we're in production. He goes, no, I, I want this. And he kind of, kind of holding kind of tight oh, like to it. The proto. Yeah, and I'm thinking, you know, we kind of need that back, you know, but I don't want to be disrespectful. He finally um, gave it back to us, but um, he liked it. That's, that's fascinating. So you have this original line here mm -hmm. and something that's super characteristic of mm -hmm. really anything you've ever done with Down mm -hmm. Electro, it has a look. Tell me about yeah. that aspect of your Dano product. So yeah. the colors, the, I mean, I have the shift daddies, like an old right. car. You yeah, got yeah. some really yeah. wild stuff. Some crazy stuff. Yeah. It is a little too crazy. Yeah. Well, you were wise to keep it within some boundaries. I tend to do go past the boundaries and get in trouble. So I think you're the wiser of the two of us. But no, I think the, the, the mission here was to kind of borrow from some old car cosmetics. I mean, my designer was once again this Cadillac guy and he loved uh, the old stuff. And so we had the little fins on the end, kind of looked like a heat sink kind of look there and then he had that little kind of heart shaped raised area coming down and then we did the d with the with the little kind of car v thing you know so it was it's just kind of car and retro there's other brands that have tried to be retro but but dan Electra really is retro i mean started in 47 has this great history with all these musicians so we were trying to stay true to that feel so tell us about this mini line just how was it successful what do you think about it how did it come to be yeah, so the original, what we're calling the big pedals now, those were die cast metal case. They're huge, they're really too big for pedal board anymore, but uh, those were price point 79 to $100, right? Mm -hmm. And then we thought, what could we do to get the price really much lower? Now, keep in mind, we were the first to go to China on pedals, so we had a cost advantage over people that were in Taiwan or Japan or US or whatever. So. So then we thought, okay, what do we got to do to go lower? So we had to go to a, a plastic case to get the price down. And so these new ones started out at 29 and they went a little higher, but the original line was 29 to 49 retail price. And so we started out with 10 different, you know, effects and then it eventually it morphed to 30 something, I don't know, something like that. It was price point driven. It was, here's the thing. But, yeah, the first year we sold 170,000 or some crazy thing. And we were telling dealers they had to buy 100 if they want. It was just, it was nuts. It was just nuts. But that's what it was. <laughs> As a pedal maker, that's absurd. Yeah, it would never happen. I can't, yeah. I can't imagine a guy being yeah. like, is this JJ? I want to I I buy in. You're like, yeah. buy 100. Buy it's 100. Like, <laughs> click. <laughs> that's crazy. I was able to try so many effects because of these. Yeah. My personal opinion. Yeah. I think these are the most important line of effects from like the 90s. Interesting. I think so. So this I hold in my hand is the first Univibe I was ever actually wow. able to play. Wow. Wow. Uh, and there's a lot of pedals in this line. The prices were affordable. Crazy. Yeah. And despite what some people tend to say, right. they last a long time. They right. don't really break. I mean, I have toured with the tremolo on my board. I know okay. friends that have had the trim. So one of the strange things that happened is we had a great first year with these 107,000, yeah. whatever it was. Well, the factory made a totally bonehead move of saying, well, you sold 107,000. We're going to buy 10,000 sets of parts for all these 10 that you just made. Oh, boy. And I said, wait a minute. I mean, the second year sales aren't going to be anywhere close. So suddenly they've got 100,000 pedals that we have to figure out how to sell. So we began to make kits of three or five and then selling them in packs, different themes, uh, you know, that would kind of these pedals fit together. So somehow we got through them, but it was not, uh, it was not easy. Yeah, I have them in boxes, blister packs. I have just unopened <laughs> stuff. It's amazing. Well, the blister pack was because Best Buy suddenly said, we're going to be in the guitar accessory business. So they insisted on a blister pack. So we made that packaging just for them. The back talk, there's still never been a pedal like that, which is really bizarre. There's tons of reverse delay. Right. But when I plug into a back talk, along with I can't tell you how many 
artists I work with, mm -hmm. records that I know that thing is on, mm -hmm. the collectability of it's through the roof. Mm -hmm. I saw one sell for like $550. Yep. Yeah. Why is there such a cult following to that pedal? I have no idea, but I bought a few lately and we got some of the other brands of reverse delays and we listened and the back talk was just much more musical, kind of violin-like if you want to say that, but it just has a more musical quality to it. So there's something I don't know the reason, but it, the end of it is that it, it's pretty good. So, so we'd Wait, like to reissue it. Yeah, you need to. So I was going to commission you. Please Thank you. bring the back Thank talk you. back. It'd be the back back talk. <laughs> back talk V2, bringing it back. <laughs> so brand new Dan Electro pedals. Yes. Yeah. Played these at NAMM. They're really, really cool. You've got that mystery story going on here. Yeah. Yeah, tell us You're about You're a good it. player too, by the way. Thank you. Okay, so the, the, the breakup box, breakdown. That's a pedal that Jimmy Page used to record the first Zep album. Of course, it was ginormous, and, uh, but it kind of disappeared from the scene, so we brought that back. The six position selector, we toyed with the idea of making a continuously variable VR for that uh, control. But then we realized those six positions are kind of magic. And the other thing is, if you decide you like three, you'll always get that tone at three. Whereas with a knob, you might be off a little bit. So we decided to stay with the selector. So basically, it just hits the front of the amp, the breakup's happening in the amp, so you're getting a very organic distortion, and people are loving that, yeah. The, this one's phenomenal. 50-year-old pedal, so we had to rough up the outside to make it look like it'd been on the road for 50 years, so yeah. Love it. How about the Eisenhower fuzz? Okay, so that was a fuzz that was, has been out there from the 60s, popular in the vintage market, but had no EQ, and so we amped up the gain, made everything sweeter, the octave is more prominent now, and uh, the EQ is cool, and that sculpt switch is cool. It cuts the mids and boosts the bass, you get this crazy thing going on, so yeah, that's what that's about. Thanks so much for watching this. I hope you enjoyed it. Since filming this episode, Steve and Dan Electro have put out three new pedals. It is the 3699, that's his Fox Tone Machine. Then we have the Roebuck, which is a classic Ibanez MT10 MOSFET distortion replica. And last but not least, he put out the back talk again. I'm so excited to get that on one of my new boards. If you like this, hit like, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell icon to get notifications of future episodes. Also, there is a link below to the JHS Show Patreon account. This is where you can go and for $5 a month, support episodes like this and all the history that we're trying to preserve and the stories we're trying to tell. So far on there, there's some exclusive content like the DOD history episode, an Eric Clapton episode, a technology of Jimi Hendrix. I do Q and A's exclusively for that. It's really, really exciting. And there is the jhsshow.com where you can get shirts and things. Thanks for watching this again and have a wonderful day.